Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, uh, and welcome to the Wilson, Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. I'm Robert Litvak, uh, Senior Vice President at the Center. I bring you the greetings from our President uh, and CEO, Jane Harmon, who unfortunately cannot be with us today because she's in London. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, host today's event with uh, Professor y Jan Schneevar, um, an eminent uh, uh, Czech uh, economist and, uh, and leader. Um, the Wilson Center, uh, for those not familiar with us, is a public, private, nonpartisan institution established by an act of Congress, and it serves as the official memorial to America's 28th president. Uh, we tackle global issues through independent research, open dialogue, and actionable ideas. The center serves as a bridge between academia and government and provides uh, a safe political space uh, for addressing key public policy issues. Next year, the Wilson Center will celebrate its 50th anniversary. Uh, the founding father of the Wilson Center was the late Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan. In 1968, the legislation was passed creating the Wilson Center. So it's our 50th and it's a centenary uh, for memorializing Wilson. And it was in, in a, a, a century ago that the set of actions that he really spearheaded led to the creation of a number of states in, in Europe and, and uh, he pioneered uh, the uh, principle of self national self-determination. So uh, today's event is one in a series that we'll be doing over the next year uh, involving countries that, that uh, uh, in some way owe their uh, national independence to the Wilsonian legacy. Um, we're delighted today, of course, to host the Czech and Slovak Freedom Lecture, which commemorates uh, the inspiring struggle for freedom by the Czech and Slovak peoples. This lecture series is sponsored by the American Friends of the Czech Republic uh, and the Friends of Slovakia and by the Embassy of the Czech Republic and the Embassy of the Slovak Republic. I'd like to recognize and thank the Ambassador of the Czech Republic to the United States, uh, Heinek Mocinicek, welcome, uh, as well as Ambassador of Slovakia to the United States, uh, Peter Kmitz. Um, they're here with us today. I'm pleased to welcome Tom Dine, former president of Radio for Europe and current president of the American Friends of the Czech Republic, uh, Phil Kasich, the executive vice president of the American Friends of the Czech Republic, and Ted Russell, former U.S. ambassador to Slovakia and founding chairman of uh, uh, Friends of Slovakia. Uh, thank, thank all of you for the work that you do to support this program. Uh, over the last 18 years, this lecture has given the Wilson Center and its Global Europe Program uh, the privilege of hosting, among others, former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, the Solidarity, Le Solidarity Leader and prominent newspaper editor Adam Michnik, uh, the former uh, Czech President uh, Václav uh, Klaus, and former Ambassador uh, Michael uh, Zantowski. Uh, at Columbia University, uh, Professor Jan uh, Schweinar uh, researches the um, uh, effects of government policies on, on firms, labor and capital markets, corporate, national and global governments, and performance and entrepreneurship. A 2008 presidential candidate in the Czech Republic and a former economic advisor to Václav Havel, Professor Schweinar is a founder and chairman of, uh, is it pronounced Serge? Serge, yeah. Serge an American-style economics program in Prague that educates doctoral students from Central and Eastern European uh, countries and beyond. He serves as co-editor of the Economics of Transition, is a fellow of the uh, European Economic Association, and is a research fellow of the Center for Economic Policy in London and the Institute for the Study of Labor in Bonn. Pros Professor Schmenar was also the founding director of the Economic Institute of the Academy of Sciences of the Czech Republic, among other leadership positions at uh, uh, European economic bodies. Um, the professor will give a half hour lecture or so on, on the topic today, which is the Czech Republic and the world economy. That'll be followed by uh, um, questions and answers, and then I'll call on some of the organizers to come up and present the, the award to the professor. So with that, please join me in welcoming Professor Jan Schweinar.
you. Thank you very much for such a, such a nice introduction. Thank you all for uh, having me here. I am uh, very pleased to be here also because I've uh, followed and uh, come to lectures to the Wilson Center while I was a student, uh, Cornell and Princeton, and then in my various faculty positions whenever I was in Washington. Uh, it is truly a remarkable institution. Congratulations. Uh, you've really done extremely well. It's one of the pillars of, of the American uh, uh, not-for-profit uh, educational research and more public interest uh, institutions. So it's, uh, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, Czech and Slovak Republic. It's wonderful to be here. I, among places where I taught was also the University of Pittsburgh, where the Pittsburghers are very uh, proud of uh, the heritage uh, that they have from the Pittsburgh agreements that uh, started Czechoslovakia, and as I understand, you will have actually celebrations uh, commemorating that, so I think, I think that's, that's wonderful. I'll um, say a few words about uh, the economic situation, and hopefully we'll have a discussion. So before I say a few words, uh, uh, it reminded me of uh, when John Major apparently first saw uh, Boris Yeltsin, there was a short meeting, and at the end he says, well, uh, you know, Mr. President, can you tell me in one word how's the Russian economy doing? And Yeltsin says, uh, good. And Major says, well, I, you know, that was a bit too short. Can you tell me in two words? And he says, not good. <laughs> so uh, so I'll, I'll do more than two words, but uh, try not to keep it too long. All right. Uh, so this is the structure of the world economy. Just to get us a sense, the US EU, still almost uh, half of it. China, obviously, now growing dramatically and being very large. I'll go quickly. This is the uh, European Union. Um, so uh, notice uh, the importance of uh, Germany, United Kingdom, France, and then followed by Italy. Czech Republic about 1.2% within that. A big difference to be expected in post-Brexit. Suddenly Germany is over a quarter, France, Italy, and, uh, and obviously Britain will be missed it very much both for political reasons but also in terms of the economic might. And I will return to that because I think it's very important in what uh, we, can, we can expect. So the Czech economy, okay, about a quarter of a percent of global GDP, the world as a whole. Uh, a little bit more if you use purchasing power parity, but I think that nowadays actually using market prices, uh, GDP is a, is a better measure. Uh, relative to China, as it's always good to get a different perspective, it will be about the 25th biggest province within China. So the lesson here is that it's a, within the global setup, a small economy, okay, and uh, it's with a high degree of openness. Most of the, what's produced is exported and most of what's consumed is imported and high dependence on foreign markets. So that's really an important thing. And, and by the way, I will mention Slovakia in the process, and it's very similar. So whatever I say about the Czech economy, in many respects, Slovakia, of course, in terms of openness, even more open than the Czech economy as a percent of what's produced. Okay. Um, so uh, historically, uh, Czech Republic was the uh, uh, 15th, is 15th richest country amongst the 28 EU countries. The last time that we have measurement, 2016. Uh, the per capita exchange rate based thing is the 26th in terms of OECD countries. And just to have a comparison, in 1929 it was 12th position globally, more probably moving even higher right before World War II. And again, I'll say a few more words about that. Uh, so this gives you a comparison with other countries. So as you can see, it's kind of in the middle of the spectrum. Uh, of the European economies, the US being for comparison all the way uh, on the left. So uh, doing relatively well, for instance, compared to Portugal nowadays, uh, and uh, you know, but not quite anywhere near. And I will also stress, and I might as well say it now, that looking at GDP per capita can be misleading from the standpoint of welfare, because GDP includes what's being paid to capital and there is a significant amount of GDP that's paid to multinational corporations, which then expatriated through dividends abroad. <coughs> so I will be stressing that wages have been quite low, and that's despite the fact that GDP per capita is not so low in some of these comparisons. Okay. Now, what's important is uh, there is a, almost a law in economics, and essentially what this regularity says, that countries tend to trade 
with countries that are close to them and that are similar to them, either in terms of size of GDP, physical proximity, language, uh, historical, cultural proximity, and so on, which means that uh, for the Oh, thank you. That the implication for the uh, Czech uh, Republic and Slovakia uh, as well here is that it's highly dependent on the EU markets and Germany in particular. Okay. So while it is good, and I always uh, recommend to business people that they should try to diversify and uh, trade with uh, and invest also to other countries, as a regularity, it's going to be very difficult to increase very sizably. Uh, the trade, let's say, with the United States, even if there were much deeper liberalization of trade between the United States and Czech Republic or United States and Slovakia. Okay? So in some sense, uh, this uh, proximity to the European Union means that one way or another, most trade will be with the European Union and Germany in particular. Um, so this gives you the picture of the Czech trade. As you can see, over 30% is with Germany, uh, significant then comes Slovakia as second, Poland as third, not everybody realizes that this is the ranking or order, and then France, UK, Austria, and so on. So again, uh, most of the other countries, as you can see, are the European Union, Germany playing a very, very strong uh, part in that in particular, and that's true for both uh, Czech Republic and Slovakia. Okay? And the US, as you can see, is just 2.3%, even though the U.S. is the single largest economy in the world in terms of GDP. So uh, let's talk just a little bit about the global economy to get the context of where we are. So the global economy, the good news is that it's growing at a faster rate. And it was palpable a couple of weeks ago when there were the meetings here in Washington of the IMF and World Bank. The consensus, to the extent that there was one among the ministers of finance and governors of central bank, was that the picture of the world economy is much more rosy positive than it was before. The European Union is now growing. It has still, of course, the struggles uh, with governance in terms of refugee crisis, the prospects of Brexit and how it's going to be uh, resolved or negotiated. China uh, doing surprisingly well compared to what was expected but it needs reforms, needs rebalancing, and if it does reforms and rebalancing, there are risks involved in that. So there are uncertainties there. The US economy growing, okay? There is obviously risk factors linked to the Trump uh, administration, a lot of uncertainty as to which direction and what will happen, but nevertheless, institutions such as the IMF are mildly optimistic about uh, what will be happening in the next two years. So my take on that is that this is a really opportune, very propitious moment for countries such as the Czech Republic and Slovakia because with an economy growing and Europe growing uh, for the first time strongly in a number of years, this is the time when one could really move forward if one has a good government in place that can take advantage of it. And in the contrary, you know, not so if the government is incapable of uh, uh, carrying out the needed adjustments. So this just to give you a picture over several years, the world economy in terms of growth, growth of GDP on the top. Uh, the remarkable thing is that the advanced economies grow uh, slower, obviously, than the developing emerging markets, about half, at most half the rate. The euro area is getting out of the recession in which it was and beginning to grow. Uh, and within that, even countries that were not growing before, like Greece and uh, Italy are beginning to grow, so it's a very, very positive news for the first time. Uh, in the developing countries, China and India playing the major part, pulling things up, and Brazil and Russia finally getting out of a recession, so those also then playing a positive part in terms of the global economy. So we are at a very, very special point in the sense that all engines of growth, in a way, all important engines of growth, are firing and uh, playing a positive, positive part. So uh, just a little bit about the European Union and the European Monetary Union, the Eurozone. Um, recent political problems, we all know about Brexit, the extremist movements uh, that uh, you know, have appeared everywhere. But I think the important thing is that the European economy is growing. And unemployment, which was very high in most countries, is decreasing. So these are really important issues. The question is uh, to what extent uh, 
the politicians are going to be able to reestablish links to people because they're obviously detachment from the elites and the voters. Um, what's going to be the common and effective position vis-a-vis -vis Russia, given its geopolitical uh, goals? And um, what's going to be the position on migration? And uh, they have to finish the quantitative easing, the expansionary monetary policy, and the economic restructuring that's needed, especially in the southern tier of countries in, in Europe. So this is the expected growth, again, of various countries from relatively high growth in countries like Ireland, Slovenia, Malta, Luxembourg, all the way down to Italy uh, and uh, uh, Greece, as you can see, for the first time, actually growing quite, quite significantly. Okay. But quite a variety across, <coughs> across the various countries. So here is the public debt, and it's important to realize that whatever is happening now actually globally, not just in Europe, is in a condition where countries are much more indebted than they were in the previous decades. So the maneuvers, any kind of economic maneuver, is problematic because the debt is hanging very heavily, and especially if interest rates are going to rise, as is now happening, uh, renegotiations of the debts for the countries that are heavily indebted, Italy, for instance, has a debt which is over 120% of its GDP. They managed to renegotiate it to extend the uh, expiration, but nevertheless, paying that debt at a higher interest rate can be next to impossible, if not impossible. So the European situation is not resolved in the sense of going forward at higher interest rates, which sooner or later are likely to happen. Here, the Czech Republic, with foreign debt at about 37%, is in a relatively advantageous position relative to uh, other, other countries. Uh, there is quite a difference in terms of deficits that countries are running in Europe. And, uh, and in fact, uh, countries like Germany that have been running surpluses, both in terms of uh, government deficit and current account uh, surpluses, are obviously in big disequilibrium with the southern countries that tend to run deficits. And within Europe, you actually uh, have big distinction in terms of uh, how countries are doing in terms of deficits and surpluses. That is important because often China is blamed for running a surplus on current account, but actually Germany and Northern Europe is running a much greater surplus than China. So it is a European phenomenon, European problem, more than China versus Europe or China versus the United States. So Brexit, a few words, very important. Referendum, 52% versus 48%. Uh, what does it really mean? Well, the British pound devalued immediately, so the financial markets reacted right away. There are all sorts of options that are being discussed uh, uh, from a hope of full EU membership, which obviously is not going to materialize, maybe a Norway-type agreement, maybe a Swiss-type agreement, maybe a customs union like the Turkeys have, Turkey has, Canada all the way down to just uh, World Trade Organization rules. All these are options and mixtures of that. And obviously, the negotiations will be tough and uh, long. Uh, and uh, the gravity relationship that I mentioned before means that Britain, whether it likes it or not, its natural trading partner will continue to be the European Union. So under what conditions that trading will take place is decisive in terms of the welfare or welfare loss that will appear uh, in Britain and, of course, symmetrically uh, at a smaller scale in, uh, on the continent. Okay? So um, I think for the uh, Czech Republic, what's really important that came clearly also during the meetings here two weeks ago, uh, when I talked to uh, senior British uh, officials that were, are involved with the European Union, uh, they were saying that Basically, we are the country that has always been insisting that decision-making will be within the European Union rather than within the Eurozone. And we think that the rest of the countries will not be able to do that because they are not strong enough. So decision-making will move into the Eurozone, and the other countries that are not part of the Eurozone will effectively be informed of what has been decided before they were brought to the table with well, the EU. So um, this is now a big warning signal to the countries that are not yet in the Eurozone. Slovakia is, Czech Republic is not. 
So mm -hmm. a warning for the Czech Republic uh, whether or not to enter the Eurozone for yet another reason, which is uh, where the decision will be made. Um, China, uh, just very quickly, because it's an economy that has been growing the fastest, and as you saw from the pie chart, is now the third largest economy in the world, um, struggles with unfinished reforms. It's heavily indebted uh, as a country internally, uh, has some external debt as well, has very inefficient state-owned enterprises. Uh, there has been recent strengthening of uh, uh, the leader Xi Jinping's uh, power, probably similar to what Deng and Mao had before, so that um, the uh, positive features, if you want, are that the economic factors that are there will push China more towards reforms. The troublesome features for the rest of the world is uh, the rising nationalism, possibly ethno-nationalist foreign policy, there is the diversion of pragmatism from pragmatism, which was there before, to more ideological positions and more intensive control uh, over the economy politically. Okay. So uh, what are the implications for the global economy is that it, on one hand, the Chinese economy is getting more closed, uh, relying more on domestic demand rather than on foreign demand, which is what economically other countries do want. They want China to start consuming more. Okay. But um, it is, this closeness will have some repercussions globally. And it's also likely to use more its economic might for foreign policy. So you have the One Belt, One Road initiative. The Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank is uh, getting into higher gear and so on and so forth. Chinese are buying land in Africa and uh, natural resources. So there is much more of a political economy importance than there was historically on the part of what China was doing. So just in summary, to get the global perspective, so um, there are positive expectations in terms of growth. There are risks, the threat of economic nationalism, including the United States, uh, the threat of irrationality and lack of pragmatism in economic policy. And for small open economies, such as the Czech Republic and Slovakia, this may increase economic uncertainty because they're much more open to whatever happens in the world, whether positive or, or negative. So quickly on Czech Republic, competitiveness and growth. So um, it's an economy that's capable of growing fast. It grew very fast in the early 2000s, recently uh, achieving 5% growth in 2015. But if I were to give you the long-term perspective from what one observed over the last 27 years, um, the public policy and institutions are unpredictable and not really very, very firm. So uh, the effect has been that the country has not been catching up fast with the more developed countries over the last three decades. The catching up has been much slower. The convergence has been much slower than was expected. People would expect in the first decade there would not be perhaps that much convergence. But 30 years when you take where Western Europe was at the end of World War II, by mid-70s, it very significantly caught up with the United States, much more than the Czech Republic, which is in totally open zone in terms of trading, movement of labor markets, et cetera, relative to Europe, okay, to neighbors. So this is the convergence relative to the US, and this is at purchasing power parity, which is favorable in terms of showing greater convergence than if we did it in terms of current exchange rates, taking whatever the Czech Republic produces, convert it in dollars and compare it to the US. Okay, so it shows you know, slow convergence, but uh, as I say, actually this is uh, more of a suggestion of convergence there is, but still at about 55%, uh, uh, moving from 48% uh, to 55% over um, uh, close to three decades, 25 years. Okay. Um, this is the economic level relative to mm -hmm. Austria. So this is based on a historical uh, study going back to actually 1820, but what's important, I think, is to realize that before World War II and right after World War II, where Austria is 100, so it's this line, the uh, Czech GDP per capita was similar or higher than Austria. Okay? Then you can see the decline over the decades um, under the communist regime, 
and uh, still decline in the you know, first uh, decade or so, and now some increase, but very, very slow, slow increase. So the, question, the big question is why isn't there more of a convergence over, over such a long period of time as almost 30 years now? So this is the competitiveness ranking. As you can see, this is from the Institute for Management Development in Lausanne, who do this study regularly every year. And uh, so there is some variation, but not a major upward trend. Czech Republic is still sort of around 28, 30 uh, in terms of the rank, so not improving uh, over time. Uh, this is a picture which you may not quite see here, but uh, it shows the relative competitiveness of Czech Republic uh, versus um, Europe and North America. And basically it says that Czech Republic is weaker in innovation, in the quality of institutions, and uh, in infrastructure. Oh, infrastructure is not so good. Um, <coughs> the fiscal policy and government policies more broadly, uh, the Czech Republic has low public debt, as I was showing you before. But again, put in perspective, it started with almost no debt. Okay? It had some debt when communism ended, but it had some um, uh, loans also, unfortunately, to countries like Libya and Iraq that weren't likely to pay Russia uh, right away. But it was a very low debt country, which is still low debt relative to others, but increased the indebtedness, okay? It has a relatively efficient system of taxation, except for one important thing, and that's the social insurance contributions, which are levied on uh, wages and salaries and make labor un unusually expensive, okay? Uh, what are the main current problems, as I see, of the country? It's the quality of investment. For instance, in transportation, there are still very few fast trains. And last week, some of you may have noticed, there was big news that if you go from Berlin to Vienna, it's faster to go through West Germany and avoid Czech Republic than the shorter route, which would be through Prague into, into Vienna. Okay. So that just shows you markedly you know, how neglected this part, and again, 30 years is a long period. If it were five or 10 years, it's excusable. When it's 30 years, you have to ask about the quality of uh, the leaders, policy makers in that. The other part that I would stress is uh, high quality education and research and development. Uh, some of you may have noticed, uh, again, last week or two weeks ago, uh, one of the main rankings of universities came out around the world and no Czech university is among the top 400. Um, you know, if you said, well, it's not in the top 100, but it's 200, you could say, well, that's bad, but uh, okay, we can make it. But not to be even in the top 400, and we can argue whether the rankings are good or bad, but orders of magnitude, you know, it's not in the top three, 300, let's say, right? So, um, so the country is educating a large proportion of young people at the tertiary level at the university. But the quality, as measured by these indicators, and there are about three others, and they are pretty much highly correlated, so they'll tell you the same story, is just, just not there. Right? So if you're advising a high school student, should that student go and study in the Czech Republic or at a good Western university? Well, the answer is, uh, is clear. Right? Um, so really what's, what is needed is the quality. It's, uh, the quantity is there. It's the quality of transportation, quality of education, quality of research and development. It's a country that's uh, not based on natural resources, so that's not going to be the way forward. It has to be human capital. It has to be education. It has to be the quality of uh, both pure and applied research. And it has been significantly neglected or not given priority. Uh, there is an inefficiently functioning legal system, unpredictable still in many respects. Uh, the bureaucracy could be much more efficient uh, than it is. And there has been some heavy-handed approach to issues of tax collection, for instance. So those are some of the big, big issues that are uh, outstanding. So, um, so the question is how can the country grow, converge? And how to raise wages uh, and without overheating because uh, right now there seems to be shortages of, of labor in, in many, many areas, which is, by the way, a Europe-wide problem. The European Investment Bank has done a big study now, uh, which I'm participating in, interviewing managers all over, and the lack of uh, skilled labor, of particular skills, seems to be a more general, general problem. Okay? 
So the first thing to, is to realize is that the Czech Republic has managed to have recessions that other countries have not brought upon themselves. In particular, in 1996-97, and then continuing in 98-99 with stagnation, there was a major recession which no other neighboring mm. economy had. So uh, this was not an external shock because uh, neighboring countries were not affected. It was something that was brought about, uh, in my view, the main cause was the large-scale bank lending without collateral, primarily for privatization at the time. The inadequate legal system, the banks suddenly realized that they were not getting repaid and will never get repaid because there was no way to enforce contracts. So they stopped lending. That, of course, uh, shifted domestic demand down significantly and led to uh, a big recession, from which uh, the country never recovered in the sense that sub subsequently it resumed growth like the neighboring economies, but at 10 to 20 percent below, given that uh, it never achieved growth that would be faster than the neighboring economies. Okay? Um, then there was the general recession that everybody was in, but then again in 2011, 2013, there was a recession that no neighboring economy experienced. So again, domestically generated primarily from highly restrictive uh, fiscal government policies and a lot of induced uncertainty where the government policies were zigzagging and people started being worried, not ex what to expect. So consumers delayed expenditures of durables, the firms delayed investments. <laughs> and export was the only force that was pushing, pulling the economy up, and that was not sufficient at the time. So another, uh, another recession. So if the country will every decade or two decades uh, generate a self-generated recession, it's hard to converge to, um, to a higher, higher level. So this gives you the um, uh, breakdown in terms of uh, the blue line is exports. As you can see, that's what's really pulling the country up. That's what's above zero most of the time. Uh, and GDP is the black line, and you can see the uh, going under zero under the horizontal axis dipping uh, several times here, twice uh, the big recession and then the induced self-induced recession. Um, this is a decomposition which breaks the overall uh, GDP, the black line, into what's due to household consumption, government, and as you can see, the government here, which is the... Uh, beige pink line here uh, is going down significantly uh, rather than going counter cyclically. So while in the Great Recession the government indeed pulled the economy up, during the self-induced recession it pulled it down and induced the recession. So uh, there was a particular aspect to monetary policy. Many of you heard the uh, central bank, Czech National Bank, decided to uh, actually depreciate, reduce the value of the crown and hold it at the lower level from 2013 until earlier this year, April 2017, uh, it was worried about uh, deflation. And so by reducing the value of the crown, in imported goods become more expensive and that can raise the price level. Right? Uh, and since it's a very open economy, the imported goods and services are very, very <coughs> significant. It helped. And it, by the way, also helped in the sense that it stimulated the economy. Interestingly enough, the Czech economists didn't think of it that way. Uh, I found it when I was telling them, well, you've uh, basically prevented the recession from continuing. They didn't, most of them didn't think of it. Uh, but it certainly had that effect. Or put it differently, it would be the only country in the world historically that didn't generate stimulus by pursuing this policy. Um, so that was very important because here the policy had two positive effects. It prevented deflation and stimulated growth. Normally there is a trade-off. You get something at the expense of something else, right? Here it was actually that both of these factors were going in the same direction, namely positive, uh, positive direction. It was very controversial because the uh, uh, middle and upper middle class that likes to take vacations uh, abroad felt that the price of going on holidays became more expensive. And indeed it did. But it wasn't so huge. The uh, uh, depreciation was on the order of 5 or 6 percent. So to give you an example, the Polish Lotti during the same time as it was floating depreciated much more vis-a-vis -vis euro than the Czech crown without any intention of the Polish National Bank, just simply uh, forces of supply and demand. 
So this was uh, actually engineered. Okay, so real GDP uh, growing. There is an expectation this year that the growth will be quite strong, different scenarios, and then slowing down somewhat maybe uh, the following year. So there is some growth, but again, it's not phenomenally faster than what you see in the other countries with which uh, uh, the Czech Republic would like to catch up uh, and is trying, has been trying to catch up. Inflation is now in the area of 2%, which is what the central bank and central banks generally would like to have, so uh, that is uh, successful. Uh, unemployment, uh, the lowest in Europe. Uh, I already mentioned that there is a shortage of people and unemployment. The Czech Republic always had a um, very low unemployment rate. In fact, let me, since this is a Slovak and Czech uh, uh, audience and, uh, and lecture, uh, we did quite a lot of research in the labor markets in Slovakia and the Czech Republic in the early, mid-1990s. What was very interesting is that uh, in the Czech Republic, unemployment was very low. In Slovakia, it shot to double digits. So in Czech Republic, it was between 2 and 3%. In Slovakia, went above 10%. And um, I think it has been by historians totally underappreciated that the separation of the two countries may have had very significant economic underpinning in the sense that if you have unemployment around 2%, you want to go fast, right? If you have unemployment rate over 10%, you want to go slower because you can really cause a lot of damage in terms of social welfare, right? So the economic uh, discrepancy in what happened in the two countries were very significant and presumably weighed on uh, the uh, decision at the time as to whether to have rapid continuation of reforms or a slower one. So there has been now some uh, mm. uh, increase, rapid increase in real estate prices uh, over the last uh, year on year, about 20% uh, on average. So if you want to buy an apartment in Prague, new apartment apparently now one square meter is uh, about $3,800, which has uh, significantly up. And the reason is that Prague has become a very popular destination, but also the, there is the, what's called the Airbnb factor, that a lot of people buy apartments and rent them through the Airbnb system and uh, make quite a lot of money. So the market has uh, heated up quite a lot. Uh, the labor market, I mentioned, very low unemployment rate. Um, and uh, the wages are finally rising somewhat on the order of 5% real. But, um, but the question is, why so late? Why have the wages not been rising before? And I am a labor economist, and I frankly don't have a good answer. I mean, there are a number of questions, there are a number of explanations. The trade unions were discredited because they were <coughs> Communist Party uh, levers in, in the factories and so on and so forth. Um, the... Um, um, uh, government has not been uh, trying to induce anything, has stayed very much outside of it within the tripartite system. But it is interesting when I talk to business people and they are complaining that there are not enough uh, workers and they've been complaining for quite a long time. And you say, have you tried to increase wages? They look at you as if you're coming from Mars. So you have to say, well, look, sub supply demand in any market when there is a shortage, presumably price goes up, right? And uh, it's the last thing that they are thinking about. So it's very interesting that there is a considerable resistance to raising wages. And uh, there are huge profits that are being uh, sent out in terms of dividends in sectors like banking and others to parent uh, corporations, uh, companies uh, abroad. And it's generating a lot of questions in terms of whether there should be a sectoral tax or anything like that. So this is something that's unresolved. but. Uh, but it is true that still now, almost 30 years after uh, the revolution, the wages are 25 to 50 percent of Austrian or German wages, <coughs> where I gave you the historical picture where they were actually higher before after World War II than in Germany or Austria. So the final thing which is really, I think, very important is to give you an evolution of the opinion on euro adoption. The red line says the number of people or percentages who are against, and the blue is for. And uh, you go back um, at the beginning around 2000, 2001, and the four were strongly uh, in majority uh, relative to the ones against, but intense political uh, pressure or uh, 
you want uh, agitation, has really made the Czechs be very skeptical about adopting the euro, which is interesting because uh, if you look at recent opinion polls in the eurozone countries, it's 70, 80, 90 percent in favor of euro. Nobody's questioning that they would like to leave the eurozone. Uh, and so here you have a country that, uh, in terms of satisfying the criteria, has uh, satisfied the criteria for uh, 15 or 17 years. It was in 2000 that the Czech National Bank announced that the country has fulfilled, is able to uh, enter the uh, RM2 system for entering euro. And, uh, and if anything, public opinion is now strongly, strongly against. We have done some um, uh, studies trying to figure out whether it would be economically beneficial for the Czech Republic to be in this Eurozone or not. It shows that yes, it would be. In fact, you can make a stronger statement. It's advantageous for it to be in any Eurozone that Germany is in, okay, because it's so close to Germany. So even if it were to break into two Euro two zones, the northern and the southern, it makes sense to be in the one with, with Germany. So given what I mentioned about the British uh, role, which is now, now will not be played at the level of the EU, and more decision making will tend to move to the Eurozone, uh, this is uh, actually heralding a problem in terms of uh, when and how the Czech Republic could enter. And in fact, in the last, um, uh, campaign for the parliamentary election, elections that just took place, um, there was only one or two countries, uh, two parties that really were in favor of joining uh, the Eurozone. Uh, the rest were firmly against, reflecting in part mm -hmm. the public opinion, but also fomenting it over time. <coughs> so just uh, to conclude, Czech Republic, uh, where is it going? So we've had 27 years of transition varied economic performance, slow convergence to advanced neighboring economies, uh, increasing openness have had, has had very good effects. There is uh, the positive things of foreign investment, trade, and so on and so forth. And there is a need to avoid increased isolation. There are voices to uh, you know, not be part of European structures and so on and so forth. And this would clearly reduce growth for an open economy such as the Czech Republic. And the, it would be even more so now than it used to be because the global value chains are now so much uh, um, uh, important in any kind of production that uh, there would be a small chance of producing virtually any product uh, without significant international exchange. We know it from the media here with respect to NAFTA, how many times the unfinished product moves across the borders with Canada or Mexico before the final product is assembled a fortiori for, for the Czech Republic, okay? Um, I would also submit that the country needs to become a, an active player within integrated Europe, in particular after Brexit. So in terms of economic policies, there is no reason to complain that Brussels is dictating. If the country is the member of the club, it should be there. It's a medium-sized country and uh, use its diplomacy to really have as much weight as possible in coalitions or, or alone in formulating that foreign policy with Russia and other, other issues that are there. There is definitely greater need to be in the Eurozone due to Brexit now, again strengthening that argument. And there is a need for smart domestic restructuring in terms of the economy that I mentioned and a good public policy, which has not been uh, the case uh, in many periods of the last 27 years. So I'll stop here, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Schmenar. We have uh, time for a few questions. Uh, if speakers could please identify themselves. Their microphones will circulate around. And who has the first question? Uh, yes. Yeah. Professor Schmenar. Uh, John Weeking, I'm retired. economic affairs for a good long while there. And I want to thank you when I started out in that area for the papers that you had written in the 1990s, which really brought me up to speed and gave me an some analytical tools to look at thank the you. region. Thank you. Um, one of the uh, topics that I looked at when I was uh, following Czech Republic was the transition from a manufacturing economy to an economy based on services and tr traded services. And that struck me as one of the areas where Czech Republic had a 
a certain comparative advantage, at least over its neighbors. But um, uh, you talked about the trade, and that was trade in goods, I believe. You referred to real estate. You referred briefly to the profits in the banking sector going out. Do you have anything else to say about traded services and whether uh, w what, the, what the status is of, of mm -hmm. public transition? Yeah. yeah, so so there is a, a pattern like with uh, all economies that go through this stage of development that there is a shift from uh, manufacturing to services. Uh, the Czech Republic did r somewhat less than many other economies because it's a little bit more like Germany and the German economy, of course, has a signi more significant part in industry than other advanced economies. And so the Czech Republic, Slovakia, uh, to a significant extent, mimic that because they're so linked to the German economy. But undoubtedly, uh, tradable services have increased uh, uh, in um, you know, the amount. I think that uh, uh, one thing that's problematic in general in Europe is that there still isn't an integrated financial sector. If uh, the financial sector got completely integrated in Europe, then uh, the integration of services for the Czech Republic would be even greater. Uh, but already as is, uh, everything from consulting firms, auditing firms, you know, all the kind of services that you can think of at first sight uh, are there, are represented, are, are global. Uh, so in that sense, the economy is uh, significantly integrated. But um, uh, one aspect I think that's, that's really difficult is I mentioned that the uh, functioning of the legal system uh, etc. is still not where it should be after this many years, and that has stayed outside, um, significantly outside of the world competition. There are international firms, White and Case, and others, but uh, but it's not as uh, seamless as it as it might be otherwise. Yeah. So there is a significant sort of um, uh, covered part of that sector that is not exposed to competition, and therefore the efficiency gains are not as strong. Other questions or comments? Uh, yes. We've got two on the side, or three, excuse me. <laughs> Thanks. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, there was a lot of talk and maybe even a little bit of excitement about trade agreements uh, such as TPP and even TTIP. Um, the environment's changed, it seems, uh, lately. But could you comment on TTIP? And have you done any work? Um, is that something that's totally dead? Uh, is it going anywhere? Um, your thoughts? Yeah, so I had a couple slides on it. I took them out uh, because <laughs> it is, I don't want to say it's dead, but it's certainly on the back burner. Uh, so yes, from something that looked like uh, might be a very uh, uh, interesting, controversial in many respects, but I think beneficial in the end agreement, uh, it has been now really moved to the back burner. I think that uh, there is no, uh, uh, no strong force that's pushing for it. I think Europe is preoccupied with Brexit. The U.S. is certainly not putting any emphasis on it. So I think that it'll be for a while before we see any resumption of uh, efforts in that direction. It is unfortunate. The U.S. and Europe are still the main trading partners. You saw from one of the pie charts, they still account for about half of the world economy. And uh, there could be significant gains from further trade liberalization, which, however, I don't think will take place in the near term. Yes. Question there. Uh, mm -hmm. My name is Martin Palaus. I uh, used to be ambassador here many years ago, and now I'm at Florida International University. I would like to ask you about uh, Visegrad cooperation or Central European cooperation. Poland, uh, Slovakia stand very high in terms of trading partners of the Czech Republic, <laughs> and obviously you hear in these days more than ever before that Visegrad could uh, present some sort of platform in communication with Brussels. One can be very doubtful whether this would be a good idea, but anyways, uh, what is your opinion about Visegrad cooperation and eventually the role of other Central European countries that traditionally belong to this space, such as Austria or Slovenia? Mm -hmm. So, so I think that you know it doesn't make sense kind of blindly to form a coalition on everything, but but I think there are enough points of common interest. All these countries are trying to converge closer to the uh, more advanced countries, and so forming coalitions that are pushing for policies that are beneficial for all these countries makes sense. So, in that sense, I think that uh, uh, especially with Britain gone. There is a little bit more of a uh, danger that the remaining large countries are going to dominate basically the decision making. 
And the only thing that smaller countries can do is to form a coalition on particular issues because then they have, then they have some, some results. I think Poland is instructive because it's a relatively large country, uh, not so much in GDP, but in terms of population, almost, almost 40 million people. And you can see that being assertive as they are, they do have uh, you know, more impact than the countries like Czech Republic that's more passive in, in terms of its approach. Uh, and so therefore there, I think, uh, having coalitions, and it could be not just with the countries in the region, but others as well, uh, I think could be beneficial. Yes, then one, two, three. Thanks, Jan. Um, I'm Sharon Fisher from IHS Market, and I was wondering if, I mean, given the relatively positive economic performance, I mean, what your take is on why Babish had such strong support in the latest election. And also, you mentioned that the Czech Republic, like this would be a great time for the Czech Republic to move ahead with reforms to make the economy more competitive. And um, do you think there's a chance of that now with the political constellation and like what is going to happen with the government, given Thank that no you. one wants to... Yeah, I should, I should mention, Sharon, I have collaborated a lot uh, over the years, so it's great to see you here again, and uh, thank you. I, I think that um, uh, everybody will obviously have a different take. Uh, my reading of the si political situation and why there was such a landslide for Babish and why the two relatively new and one extreme party by Okamura, one uh, party that we don't know that much about, the Pirates, each got 10%, so... Babish's Anno movement and the two getting 50% of the vote, right? And the two parties, Social Democrats and ODS, that historically would sometimes poll close to 70% are at uh, 11% and whatever, 7.5% respectively. I think that the voters just have been uh, mistrusting the established uh, parties, willing to give a chance to almost anybody who looks like they might come with an alternative uh, uh, prospect, especially if those alternative movements or parties have very charismatic, uh, sometimes highly populistic, uh, but charismatic uh, speakers. And, and that was evident in the last debate uh, which I watched on TV where um, Babish was hitting hard, Okamura was, you know, superb given what he was doing, but he was pushing it very persuasively. The pirates were good. Social Democrats were kind of fatigued and um, you know, saying, I visited the country and uh, people feel this way and you know, there was no message. So, so my sense is that people really have been <coughs> um, uh, saying uh, um, the established parties have been here for a long enough time and, uh, and it relates to my theme here, you know, the wages have not been uh, growing. You know, why are we a few miles from the border earning a third of what people across the border are earning? Now, why are they not moving there more? And many of them are. The doctors, the nurses are moving. When you go to Prague hospitals, there are very young doctors and very old doctors, nobody between sort of 35 and 55, right? They're all gone. But, uh, but still, mobility is not sufficient to equalize them, and people are upset. They're very, very, very upset. Now, can the country, I think this is really an opportune moment, and it's possible that Slovakia will take more advantage of it than the Czech Republic. We'll see if the Czechs will manage to get a government together that will be action-oriented. But uh, when there is such a uh, looming boom as we see, and these open economies can really benefit, and if you uh, carried out some important reforms uh, in terms of, as I said, infrastructure, high quality infrastructure investments, education, and so on, uh, one could have really remarkable rise. And, uh, and so it's the Czechs' uh, opportunity to lose. Time's just about up, but two quick questions there and, and there, Mr. Schellman. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, and, and thank you, Professor Schweiner, for a a uh, very uh, full uh, tour of the economic landscape. Since Michael Krauss, uh, political science, Middlebury College, since Sharon has already uh, largely preempted my question, um, I still wanted to push you a little further about your sense of like your optimistic scenario in terms of the out, uh, coalitional outcome of the election versus uh, uh, maybe a pessimistic mm -hmm. <laughs> one. And uh, on, a, on a very different uh, theme, you have spent a lot of time, you've invested a lot of time in training young economists in, in the country, uh, both here and over there. So 
What is your take on the state of uh, Czech economics in terms of the profession? Thank you. Yeah, so, so the, the country now has many very good economists, number, you know, younger economists they, that were educated at Sergi I, which is the place where I uh, um, have worked and founded it with Czech colleagues before. Um, I don't think that's the problem. I think the problem is more what you, where you started your question, to what extent will the existing political parties uh, they, that have been there for a long term and that represent kind of a stability of the democratic system, right, uh, at which point in the negotiations, if at all, they will be willing to enter into a coalition. And uh, we understand bargaining has to be tough and you have to have you know, uh, your own position at the beginning and so on. So it's not related to that. It's more kind of at which point would you move and have something that makes the country be prosperous because you have a country uh, interest in mind and are willing to compromise for that. To what extent will you not do that and uh, either cause unstable government or you know, maybe unstable or government that would be leaning towards the more extreme uh, parties and movements for support? And at that point, it's not clear that it would really be moving the country in the direction that would be desirable from the, in the long run. So I think that's really the danger or, or the point, the focal point now. Last question. Dr. Uh, Srena Robert uh, Dobek with American Friends of the Czech Republic. Did the ANO party uh, state any specific e economic policy? So they don't, uh, I think, intentionally uh, have much in terms of uh, specifics, but they did, they did have uh, particular, particular points that they made at the end of the campaign. So, for instance, they were very much for integration with the European Union, but not entering the Eurozone. So they were reflecting the uh, public opinion that you had here. I think what they stand for and what uh, Andrei Babish stands for, and I just know him because we do exchange uh, opinions uh, on economic matters periodically, uh, he wants efficiency. So if you ignore sort of his own self-interest, and that's a sort of chapter on its own, uh, he is very much interested in increasing efficiency. So I, for instance, am on the supervisory board of the Czech airport, Prague airport. That efficiency has increased dramatically. He put in new management uh, and so on and so forth. And so if wants to judge the state-owned enterprises by what's happened there, then the efficiency gains and uh, elimination of corruption, et cetera, has proceeded on a major scale. What it will translate to in terms of uh, going forward will depend on, as I was mentioning to Michael Kraus, uh, with whom, by the way, we go back to graduate school. He, he went to a very good graduate school. Princeton. <laughs> and uh, so, so I, thi I think that, you know, it's going to be over the next uh, several months that we'll see whether this government will be able to undertake uh, reforms or not. Uh, and I actually met with Babish um, recently and discussed the priorities that I just outlined to you here. Uh, so he's listening. I know he understands things. Uh, uh, to what extent he will want to or will be able to implement them and in coalition with whom, I think is the big, big question. Thank you. I'd now like to invite Ted Russell and Tom Dine, representing the Friends of Slovakia and the friend, American Friends of the Czech Republic, uh, to say a word to close the session and make the presentation. At the podium, please. Yeah. <clears throat> Jan, thank you so much for such a uh, sophisticated presentation, and uh, I don't think the exchange was long enough, but I think the audience is of high enough quality that it would have been also a rich time. Uh, on behalf of the Czech, of the American Friends of the Czech Republic, and uh, my good friend Ted Russell, and his friends of Slovakia, this is a certificate of appreciation uh, awarded to you in grateful appreciation for the promotion of understanding of the Czech and Slovak legacy in the struggle for freedom, overcoming 50 years of foreign domination and emerging as free, secure, and democratic nations. So uh, uh, you are in a long line of speakers in this, in this tradition, annual tradition, and uh, we congratulate you. Uh, <clears throat> Ted has already been forthcoming, and now I'll be forthcoming to uh, give you this. Don't open it here. 
it may flutter. <laughs> yeah, it may flutter around. So again, uh, thank you for what you have done for the Czech Republic and what you will be doing in the future. So congratulations. Thank you.